as I sat up off of the cold, hard linoleum floor outside of my superintendent's office, wearing my pajamas and stuffed into my sleeping bag, I thought to myself, is this really a good move? You see, the superintendent and I had been in a bit of a chess mass for the last few years. She came into a district that I loved and cared about and treated me like family, and I felt the same to them, and they made a bunch of changes that negatively impacted this school. Let me back up to the opening phase of our chess match. Year one, superintendent comes to town, puts her thumb on the principal and assistant principal. Principal resigns in January. Never seen that before. Assistant principal resigns in June. They take their 20 plus years of administrative experience with them when they leave. I was outraged. I wrote letters, I talked to school committee members, I organized protests, nothing changed this situation. Year two, superintendent hires a new principal, a new assistant principal with a combined zero years of administrative experience <laughs> in their respective roles. I was less than pleased. I was outraged when I found out she was paying them more money than the administrative team that had just left. I kept quiet until the principal called me into her office to say, Mr. Mullen, I see a little discrepancy here in the student activity account that you oversee. And I said, okay, principal, thank you. In my head, I knew exactly what she was doing. You see, I did the same thing when I was a young teacher. I had a student that I couldn't control, so I pushed on them with all the authorities I had, and I kept them there. I knew I was going to rise up. I didn't know when. It wasn't until a colleague of mine, who was more passionate than any teacher I've ever worked with before, got laid off. And on his last day of school, with zero students in the building, he let that principal know very loudly in their office that he was displeased with the current path of the district. The way the principal chose to handle that was, they called the police and had that teacher escorted off of the school grounds on their last day in the building. I knew what I had to do. I was going to show those two who ran the school. So I went to the people that did run the school, the secretaries <laughs> and the custodians. And, <laughs> and they helped me come up with a plan that the superintendent was never going to see coming. You see, I arranged for a substitute to cover my classes. And then I went to work. And I went and sat outside that superintendent's office and the student desk and chair that the custodian had laid out for me and waited for them to come to work. She was very surprised to see me there. Mr. Mullen, what are you doing here? I said, I'm waiting for the student enrollment numbers I asked you for some time ago, repeatedly. And she said, I couldn't possibly do that today. I had the school committee meeting tonight. I said, that's okay, I'll wait right here. And I did. She called her knight, the principal, to come up and talk to me. And she said, Mr. Mullen, you can't possibly be in school if you're sick. I said, oh no, superintendent, I'm not sick. I took a personal day because this was very personal for me. And I said, are you going to call the police? Loud enough for them both to hear me. She turned her tail and left as I knew she would. Superintendent left at 3 p.m. that day. I said, superintendent, do you have my numbers? Will I see you at the school committee meeting tonight? She said, no. That was a new trick of hers. Tense budget meetings where teachers were losing your job. Somehow she couldn't make it to those. So I said, OK, I'll see you tomorrow morning right here. Cut back to my opening line. I stood up with my sleeping bag, marched down the hallway in my pajamas as the students were coming off the buses. <laughs> they had a lot of questions for me. I didn't answer any questions about what I was doing until we got to my world history class. You see, we were studying Gandhi that day and his policy of nonviolent resistance to people in authority. And we talked about the similarities and the differences. And there were quite a few, but they knew what I was doing. And they knew I was doing it because I cared about them and that school. And my 15-year-old Seth had a shit-eating grin as I walked back up to the superintendent's office. It was my prep period. My plan was to sit in that desk until I got those numbers every prep period. When I sat down on that student desk, my middle-aged body said, I don't want to be here anymore. <laughs> I would like to go home and get some sleep. And the superintendent wasn't even there. I said, this is futile. I heard she had car trouble or something. My 15-year-old self laughed at her suffering. <laughs> when she came in the door, she looked broken. And I thought about the 15-year-old students and the lesson I was trying to teach them. And I knew what I had to do. 
I said, Superintendent, I know you can't get to the dealership yourself because I didn't say this out loud. <laughs> I said, I know you can't get to the dealership yourself because no one in the school building is going to give you a ride. So I went into her office and offered her a ride. I wish this was a part of the story where I could tell you that we mended fences and turned that school around, but the sorry truth is that I don't work in that building anymore. I'm not in part of that community. But I am very proud at the way I stood up to a figure of authority and gave my students an idea of what it looks like to stand up for something you love and believe in. Thank you for listening. <laughs>